Come on in. Have a seat, won't you? Oh, thank you, sir. We'll begin our interview in just a moment. Let's hold down our camera. Uh, Judge Kennedy, what is your opinion of Mr. Wells' radio play? Uh, well, I certainly have an opinion. I, I think suits should be filed against him and the Columbia Broadcasting System for their wrongdoing. Wells' uh, performance uh, on the radio Sunday evening was a clear demonstration of his inhuman instincts and his fiendish joy in causing uh, distress and suffering all over the country. He is a, a, a carbuncle on the rump of degenerate theatrical performers, and he should make amends for his consummate act of asininity. Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. Never before had a radio broadcast provoked such outrage or such chaos. Upwards of a million people convinced, if only briefly, that the United States was being laid waste by alien invaders and a nation left to wonder how they possibly could have been so gullible. Please tell us, were you at all surprised by the reaction to the radio broadcast? I think the reaction was the most damning indictment of the stupidity of the masses. Now, I appreciate what CBS and radio have done for the world, but why not respect that appreciation and not destroy all faith and confidence we have in the greatest means of getting information about the world, radio? Brilliantly directed by Wells, the War of the Worlds would become in the end the most famous radio program in history, known forever after as the Panic Broadcast. Yet it all began unremarkably. At a little past eight o'clock in the East, a Sunday evening like any other in America, with dinners being finished, dishes washed, and radios across the country turned on, more or less in unison. The Columbia Broadcasting System and stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns... It was October 30th, the eve of Halloween, a night known variously as Mischief Night, Devil's Night, Hell Night. A night that for some 200 years had unleashed all manner of trickery on the unsuspecting. On this night, in 1938, it would also unleash the pent-up anxieties of a nation. Now, Miss Hoadley. Yes? Can you describe the events that happened to you on the evening of the broadcast? Uh, of course, yes. Um, well, returning that evening from a delightful Vesper service uh, and 62-cent dinner at Hyler's, delicious, um, I changed into my house coat and prepared to shorten my velvet skirt. Automatically, I reached out and turned on the radio. The makers of Chase and Sanborn coffee, the superb blend you know is fresh, present the Of the Chase tens of Sanborn millions of Americans listening to their radios at 8 o'clock that Sunday evening, few were tuned to the War of the Worlds. The big draw on the airwaves that night was a ventriloquist act, Edgar Bergen and his wooden dummy, Charlie McCarthy. The improbable stars of NBC's hit variety show, The Chase and Sanborn Hour. A haunting we will go, a haunting we will go. <laughs> hey, Charlie, the word is hunting. Well, not on Halloween, it ain't. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie, but we'll let Nelson Eddy do the same. And it's the rousing, rip-roaring song of the vagabonds. But when the opening comedy routine gave way to a musical interlude, millions of listeners began twirling the dial. There was something called dial twisting, you know, the radio equivalent of channel surfing with the remote. 
So people turn the dial. And this is just when things are starting to heat up in the War of the Worlds broadcast. They miss the beginning. They miss the announcement that this was a play. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. All of a sudden, a startling announcement. Professor so-and-so from Princeton University had just observed several explosions on the planet Mars shooting out great jets of blue flame traveling at a rapid speed toward Earth. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. We have dispatched commentator Carl Phillips to the scene. Then, well, suddenly, a, another Phillips. announcement, a news bulletin. Carl Phillips out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, Farmer in Grover's Mill, New Jersey, had reported a meteor had fallen on his farm. And what did he say about it? He describes a hissing sound and a streak of greenish light that hit the earth with such force it knocked him from his chair. So I got the story just when the radio announcer was asking the fellow in New Jersey what it felt like uh, seeing what happened in his backyard. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us, and the police are trying to rope off the roadway leading into the farm, but it's no use. Realism got me. I didn't know then it was a play. Oh, I swallowed the whole thing as it came over the air, like a new national emergency or something. 